Good evening, everyone. Uh, merci à tous uh, d'être ici avec nous uh, ce soir. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Juste avant d'introduire uh, notre, uh, notre soirée, notre événement, um, uh, je voudrais uh, commencer en soulignant le fait que le CCA a entrepris un processus de reconnaissance territoriale à long terme en, collab en collaboration avec les membres de la nation Ganyan Gehaga. Nous reconnaissons également les nombreuses nations qui sont les gardiennes des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons ce soir et où vivent aujourd'hui des personnes issues des Premières Nations, Inuit et Métis. Nous honorons et respectons et reconnaissons ces nations qui n'ont jamais cédé leurs droits ni leur autorité souveraine et nous nous efforçons de susciter des relations positives avec les peuples autochtones et d'autres communautés de Jojage, Mounyang, Montréal. L'événement de ce soir... Euh, je vais commencer à vous l'introduire en français, mais il va avoir lieu en anglais. Euh, euh, C'est le premier euh, d'une série euh, qui s'intitule « Documenter les déplacements » et qui accompagne l'exposition euh, « Les vies des documents, la photographie en tant que projet » qui est euh, actuellement dans nos salles et qui s'intéresse à la photographie euh, en tant que moyen d'interroger notre environnement et aussi d'interpréter les euh, mécanismes qui façonnent notre monde visible. Donc cette série, c'est une invitation à des artistes nord-américains nous présenter leurs œuvres et aussi à poursuivre la réflexion sur les méthodologies et les stratégies qu'ils utilisent dans la construction d'arguments visuels. Avec cette série, on veut également euh, engager des conversations et des échanges autour de la notion de déplacement et de ses diverses significations et ses effets qui sont aussi exprimés au travers donc, des projets euh, photographiques euh, ou de films. So this series, uh, Documenter les, dé les déplacements, uh, Documents of Displacement, has been created by Hester Kaiser, uh, creator of photography and new media at CCA. And she will introduce uh, you to our guest tonight and to the thematic that uh, will be developed during the conversation. Uh, so our guests tonight are Marisa Portoles, Jinyang Kim, and Pedro Barbachano. They will present us uh, some of their work, and then after that, Hester Kaiser will moderate a conversation with our guests around this notion of displacement. And at the end, we'll take a moment for a Q&A uh, with you, with the audience, and uh, questions could be in French or in English. Um, So thank you very much for being here, and now I will let like Hester introduce you in more depth the thematic and our guest. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'll give you a short introduction of uh, the series um, and the thinking that went into um, or organize and program in, in the way that it is. Documents of Displacement is a series of public events curated alongside the lives of documents. It is modeled on the premise that the works on exhibit were considered groundbreaking because they spoke of commonly felt shifts in the surrounding world at the time when they were photographed. Their authors straddled change, whether encountered in the succession of historical epochs, telluric events, societal transformations, technological developments, or in the explorations of the innermost personal space by documenting these events in order to come to terms with them. The lens-based artists invited for documents of displacement similarly speak of dislocations in space and or time. Most sensitive to the changes we witness are those who find themselves displaced, either because of migration histories or because of their position on the axis of race, class, and gender. All participants share that their departure point for questioning notions of placemaking, of home, and of the built environment is the simultaneity of North America and elsewhere. One could say that they are all, to borrow a term from the special theory of relativity, are accelerated observers of what is changing in our world. As such, they have the power to make others see the event horizon before they happen on it themselves. As said, with us tonight are Marisa Portolese, Jin Young Kim, and Pedro Barbachano, all currently living in Montreal. When I invited them, I wasn't aware that they already knew each other. Their shared connection to Con is Concordia University, where Marisa and Jin Young hold teaching positions and where Pedro lectured. Um, this makes our evening not only a meeting of minds, but also a meeting of friends. 
And please give them a warm welcome and allow me to introduce them briefly. They're here on the front row. And I'm gonna start in the order of the generations because we have to have more respect for our elders. Um, Marisa Portolese is a Canadian Italian visual artist born in Montreal, Quebec. She's an associate professor in the Faculty of Fine Arts at Concordia University, where she obtained an MFA in 2001, portraiture, representation of women, autobiography, and familiar and cultural heritage are recurrent subjects in her practice. She has produced photographic projects featured in numerous solo and group exhibitions in Canada, Europe, and the United States. From 2017 to 2019, she was the artist in residence at the McCourt Museum in Montreal. Portolese's works have been published in magazines and journals, as well in, in three or maybe even four monographs, Un Chevreux à la Fenêtre, de Ma Chambre, Antonia's Garden, and the most recent publication, Goose Village, this year, this month, last month. She has been awarded grants from the Canada and Quebec Arts Councils and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research uh, Council and has received a Concordia University Reason Research Fellow Award in 2022. Her works are included in various corporate museum and private collections. Marisa will present Goose Village, where she has documented the lost history of a neighborhood decimated by urban developments in the 1960s, situated in Point Saint-Charles, Montréal, Quebec. The project highlights the destructive consequences of short-term political agendas and capitalist ideals that cause that cause community displacement while also commemorating the memories of the borough's residents. Jin Yang, Jin Yang Kim is a visual artist and educator whose work explores a sense of place and material culture as a core condition where personal and collective memories coalesce, expanding on an imaginary realm, bridging the past and the present. She utilizes photography, video, and object-based installations to weave together on an inventory of lived experiences that stem from the perspective of a diaspora. Her, work, her works have been exhibited and screened across Canada and internationally. She was the recipient of the Prix Lynn Cohen in 2019 from the estate of Lynn Cohen and the Musée National des Beaux-Arts du Québec, and she was shortlisted for the Prix Pierre Ayou in 2018. With sustained temporary condition, a work from 2021, Jin Young presents an assemblage of everyday objects that had once occupied the world of transient residents of Jogjoga, Munyang, Montreal area during the COVID-19 pandemic. The project brings these objects into the public square of the Place de Festival as a reminder of migrant communities that moved from one place to another, either voluntarily or through force. Pedro Barbachano is an artist, cultural worker, and educator in Chocchogue, Montréal. His photographic practice observes speculative archaeology, the critique of documents, historical evidence, monuments, and issues with the representation of subaltern identities. Barbachano identifies case studies that exhaust the photographic language and question private, public, personal, and institutional archives. His work has materialized as exhibitions, sculptural installations, books, and augmented reality experiences stemming from the photographic image. He has displayed his work in Canada and internationally. Barbachano is a recipient of several awards like the Roloff Benny uh, Fellowship and the Gabor Silazi Prize in Photography. Post-Image Research Fellowship, Stephen Goldberg Bursary, John W. O'Brien Graduate Fellowship, and the Heather and Aaron Walker Humanitarian Award. His work is supported by the Canada Council for the Arts and is housed in private collections in Canada and Spain. As an aside, if you want to get in touch with Pedro, you will find him here at the CCA, where he has recently accepted the position as the coordinator of the public program. Very much welcome, Pedro. Um, Filet, a photographic series on which uh, Pedro has been working since 2017, deals with the archaeological monuments once found in the area of the Aswan High Dam in Egypt before being partially submerged in the 1970s after its construction. The project documents one of these archeological complexes, the Philae Temple, 
which was completely dismantled and rebuilt on the nearby Agilkia Island in order to be preserved. However, the addition of sound and lighting systems modified the ideological structure and completed the temple's transition from a place of worship to a site of industrial extraction. Pedro will narrate the impact and meaning of these changes using a combination of his own work and historic photographs from the CCA collection of the temple in its original location. And now I'd like to invite Marisa uh, to the stage to begin with the presentations. Thank you. I want to start off by thanking the CCA and Hester Kaiser, Curator of Photography, for inviting and welcoming me to participate in this uh, panel discussion with Pedro and Jin in good company, and to Alexandra Lin and Emily Retailleau for organizing this event. I've been thinking about the word displace and its meaning to cause something to move from its proper or usual place, or expel or force someone to leave their home. If the project I'm presenting to you tonight were entitled Goose Village, documents of displacement would have been very appropriate considering how the people of the Goose Village neighborhood were displaced, as well as the documents pertaining to this history. Not much information could be found on the neighborhood for many years, and most material could only be sourced through oral history. But when I began the project, it was ripe for exploration when displaced documents were finally digitized and made available for public consumption. Although the architecture and all geographical traces were obliterated with the exception of a few standing landmarks, it became all the more important to bring the material back into the spotlight so that it would not be erased from memory and a mark could be left in the absence. I also want to connect tonight's presentation with the exhibition The Lives of Documents, currently on display at the museum curated by Stefano Graziano and Bas Prinsen, whose goal was to trace research materials, archiving practices, and production processes of diverse artists and authors, to highlight photographic works that investigate the landscape, its destruction, global infrastructure, and the conditions of urban and domestic space. The curators emphasize how photography reveals and expresses lived and built realities in ways traditional tools fail to represent or communicate. Their words, not mine, but I do quote Bas Prinsen, rather than using words or making a design proposal as with architecture projects, photographers make visual arguments by organizing images. When, Hes when Hester asked, to, asked me to address the work whose work I connected with the most in the exhibition, I knew the answer would not be simple since many of the artists' work resonated deeply. Like most included in the exhibition, I am drawn to places in flux. It could have been the wastelands of Louis Baltz or Lana Alma Sirugi's The Francon Quarry Project, where she meticulously traces the history of urban development in Saint Michel. But what I truly connected with the most was the premise of the exhibition rather than one individual artist, because it displays an open research model to offer insight into the lives of documents that we don't necessarily see in an exhibition format. While I cannot speak for others presenting tonight, I am connected to this form and idea of an open research model on display. How one constructs this visual arguments through photographs and how in the exhibition, the design was uh, so elegant with the inclusion of work tables akin to being in an artist's studio. This really stuck with me because that's what I was thinking when I was making Goose Village, was that not only that I want them to engage with the documents of displacement, but to preserve them via a body of work through photographs, videos, archival material, and a website that exists as a living archive. So the final result was not only to show process and research, was to show process and research, and it was just as important as the final uh, output. My contribution to the panel, therefore, tonight will focus on this comprehensive body of work spanning four years of production and research that delves into the poignant narrative of Goose Village and unveils the lost history of this once vibrant neighborhood decimated by urban development in the 1960s in Point St. Charles. What we just looked at was Super 8 footage captured by former resident Frank Kevins, who sent this to me a few weeks ago. Uh, 
just as the book, as the, the, the Goose Village book launched. And it was the first time in my life that I had seen a moving image of the Goose Village. So I, it was very special for me to share this with you tonight because you do see it uh, being destroyed. Of course, I would like to see the village not being destroyed in a moving image, but maybe that'll come shortly. So to get back to the project, the multidisciplinary project includes photography, video, installation, graphic design, and writing. It encompasses a myriad of genres such as memory mapping, oral history, portraiture, storytelling, the urban landscape, and a forensic gaze into the private family albums and thousands of historical images housed at Les Archives de la Ville de Montréal and other institutional archives. My research was approached with both a wide-angle lens and a magnifying glass, and the result is an expose of how short-sighted urban planning decisions devastated a close-knit community, forever altering the cultural and social fabric. The quest to unearth and dig deep into the history of this once thriving neighborhood is motivated not only by my longstanding interest in the genres of portraiture but, or, or storytelling, but also by the social underpinnings of my art practice. It's intrinsic to my roots in the city and identity as a second generation Canadian. I am inexorably linked to this ostensibly tight knit community because of my immigrant and familial heritage, as it is where the paternal side of my family settled when they immigrated from Calabria, Italy. Through an autobiographical and empathetic lens, both as insider and outsider, because I wasn't born in the village, my persuasion is to present a more personal interpretation of this legacy, aiming to honor the voices of those disregarded with the dignity they deserve. Like the rest of the island of Montreal, Goose Village is located on the unceded indigenous territory of Kanya Kehaka, and was built on land that was once a burial ground for Irish immigrants. It was first known as Windmill Point and later referred to as Victoria Town. It sits between the Victoria Bridge and the Lachine Canal on the south side of Point St. Charles. In the middle of the 19th century, the first living quarters were temporary garrisons erected to, uh, to house Irish immigrants but eventually permanent houses were constructed to accommodate the workers who built the Victoria Bridge between 1854 and 1859. Yet it has been speculated that members from the indigenous First Nations gathered to hunt geese nesting on the riverside marshland in the fall, hence the etymology associated with its sobriquet, Goose Village. Goose Village was once a tiny waterfront enclave encompassing seven streets, four of which were named after various bridges designed by Robert Stevenson, principal engineer of the Victoria Bridge. Britannia, Conway, Forfar, and Menai were the four main residential streets delineated by bridge on the west side, riverside to the east, mill to the north, and the south, the St. Lawrence River. This borough was also previously a plethora of cultural richness. In the early 1900s, the demographic was a mix of British, Irish, French Canadian, and Scottish inhabitants. However, the structure of the neighborhood's population started to shift after the outbreak of the First World War with the arrival of Polish and Ukrainian citizens. And then the social landscape was significantly altered with the third and largest wave of Italian mass migration after the Second World War. By the mid-20th mid century leading to 1964, Goose Village was mainly made up of Italian immigrants. In 1950, Paul Dazois, a Montreal city councillor and provincial politician infamous for instituting a slum clearance initiative approved by the Quebec and Canadian governments, otherwise coined as the Desois Plan, targeted the Goose Village. In this plan, several of Montreal's lower income sectors located downtown, deemed substandard, were earmarked for elimination. Ironically, Jean Drapeau was critical of the Desois Plan and felt it had little to do with urban renewal and disadvantaged those living in these localities. Nonetheless, he ignored these issues when he was in power. Instead, he was more concerned with pursuing his utopian dream of transforming Montreal into an international megacity. In 1962, the City Planning Department of Montreal conducted a detailed study of the architectural, physical, social, and economic aspects of Victoria Town to justify the demolitions of the neighborhood. 
The analysis summarized in the report proposes how the land could be redeveloped and utilized as a future site for the World Fair of Expo 67. The images you are seeing on the, my left are close-ups or images that were in the report, and the images on uh, my right are the actual images uh, that the photographers took the municipal photographers Jean-Paul Gilles and Hugues Lecuyer to document the neighborhood so that they could provide visual evidence supporting the claim that many buildings were derelict, validating their earmark for future destruction. So uh, these images were found in the report and then what I did is I went through the archive and found the actual image to show how uh, information was being uh, reported in this um, justification document. So while Goose Village was perhaps not always a nirvana, it was adequate and self-sufficient, providing an infrastructure resembling any small town municipality. The number two street bus serviced the area for more than 40 years. Children had access to schooling and St. Alphonse's Elementary School offered primary education from grades one to three. Throughout the village, there was an array of family-run shops. There were also various cafes and diners, and the surrounding industries employed numerous villagers. Residents also grew vegetable gardens in their backyard. And there was also the Victoria Town Boys and Girls Club, managed by Joe Berlitano, an extensive community resource where children went for after-school activities. The homes in the Goose Village were built during the Victorian era, and some were over a century old. Most apartments and standalone properties were relatively roomy and could accommodate large families. And while the exteriors needed renovating, they were generally well kept. However, it was the interiors that were most notable as dwellers decorated with nice furniture, wallpaper, and credenzas that proudly displayed porcelain tea sets and other family heirlooms. Villagers have described how they were proud of their homes and beautified them to the best of their abilities. Moreover, ample photographic proof from various photo albums illustrates that Goose Village was not a slum or as object described by multiple accounts. According to the testimonies of many residents, the neighborhood's blighted reputation was widely exaggerated by those who did not live there. In 1964, in anticipation of Expo 67, the entire neighborhood was raised to make way for the short-lived venue of the Autostad, a sports arena in its adjoining parking lot designed by architects Victor Proust and Maurice Desnoyers, eradicating 350 buildings and evicting 1,500 people from their homes. Unfortunately, as often happens in the face of capital-oriented urban development and modernization periods, the residents' voices and opinions were not acknowledged or respected in this decision-making process. Instead, they received eviction notices and the city bulldozed the Goose Village. The following image you will see were from late 1963 and early 1964, again by photographers Benny, Gilles, and Lecuyer, that document all the exteriors and this time also the interiors of the buildings slated for destruction. The brutal invasion uh, and disruption of people's lives manifest in these complex eviction images and are harbingers of the harrowing and violent wreckage that would follow. In this mammoth pile of bleakness, Goose Village is depicted as a funereal no man's land as we witness the residents amid the packing stages of their move or the solemnness of the vacated properties. The ghost town atmosphere is painfully perceptible, especially in the photographs showcasing deserted streets, depleted of the neighborhood's, neighborhood's erstwhile animated activity. The desolation evidenced by the relics and debris left behind in the empty spaces alludes to dilapidated slum-like conditions, which is not surprising since the destruction of the entire neighborhood was imminent. So by May 11, 1964, everyone in the Goose Village had moved out and the wrecking ball took effect. Goose Village was gone forever and vaporized. 
So these are some of the newspaper clippings from 1964. This is the weekend before the village was going to be raised. And this one shows the last family that was living on Bridge Street uh, that left shortly before the wrecking ball took effect, in, essentially. Adding insult to injury, the Autostadt faced its demise less than a decade later in 1976. A little bit more than a decade later, I should say. And the land was abandoned and became a terrain vague for many years. Then at one point, it became a parking lot used by the Montreal Casino and remained that way for a few decades. So for many years, when uh, people from my generation would want to go visit the Goose Village with our parents, we didn't understand where we were going because we, there was no village and it was simply a parking lot. As a result, Goose Village has disappeared from Montreal maps, effectively annihilating certain ethnic groups from this undervalued site's cultural and social fabric. The landscape was altered forever. And the people that lived in the Goose Village that went back could not recognize what they were looking at when they returned. They could never return home because it either was a parking lot or the, along the periphery you can find these patches of land. When I first began photographing on site, I was trying to figure out where my parents lived, where the streets were located. And um, so this is an image of my parents in the Goose Village that I'm holding from our family archive, approximately where they were living. And these are my parents when we went back to the site in uh, the fall of 2020 as it was transforming once again because after, in the summer of 2017, Hydro-Quebec acquired the land to build a new electrical substation. And at the time this photograph was taken, it was a fenced up construction zone and it still is to this day, just that there's, there's more happening. So the two important structures left untouched in the Goose Village are the Irish commemorative stone and a World War II memorial. The Black Rock was erected in 1859 by workers to honor the victims who died of typhus and whose remains were uncovered during the construction of the Victoria Bridge. The other stone is a World War II memorial dedicated to the men and women who served and died in the war from 1939 to 1945. Both monuments are traces of old Victoria Town and sit quietly on Bridge Street facing one another to this day. Family. The Goose Village is where all the members of the paternal side of my family first settled, when, first settled and once lived. In 1951, my uncle Gaetano uh, Portolese was the first family member to arrive in Canada and live in the Goose Village. Two years later, my father Domenico was next to follow. Initially, their living arrangements consisted of renting a room in a multi-tenant boarding house at 1155 Forfar Street, a launching pad and expected standard of cohabiting for many newly landed immigrants. This temporary measure of subsistence allowed them to put funds aside for better living conditions, and eventually they finally rented a place of their own at 1356 Forfar, where they were soon joined by Gaetano's wife, Teresa Barilaro, and my father lived with the newlyweds for several years before establishing a home base further down the street at 1317 Forfar, where he lived until the demolitions. So his new abode was a recently refurbished second floor apartment of what was originally an expansive single family unit owned by the Urachi family. My father was very close to the Urachis, and when the patriarch of the family, Nicodemo, learned that he needed a place to accommodate the arrival of his mother and his new wife, my mother, he graciously offered to convert the second floor of his property into a rental unit. So throughout the 60s, uh, up until the demolitions, my parents lived upstairs from the Urachi family at 1317. The first real breakthrough in my research emerged when I discovered a documentary by Quebecois filmmaker Sylvain L'Espérance entitled Les Printemps et Certains, 1992, which is a poetic reflection on the decline and gentrification of industrial zones in the southwest district of Montreal and their tragic history. 
It was in this film that I first saw images of the Goose Village sourced from the Montreal City archives. Then, in 2014, the Centre d'Histoire de Montréal organized the exhibition Quartier Disparu, Lost Neighborhoods, curated by Catherine Charlebois and Paul-André Linto that focused on the obliteration of the Faubourg Amlas, Goose Village, and the Red Light District. This was the grand slam of my research because the elusive records suppressed for more than 40 years were finally made public. And just a side note, I wanted to work on Goose Village as a thesis project, but I didn't have enough material uh, to proceed, and, and, and the subject was too pregnant for me to just focus on, to just have oral history alone as, as, as a source. So in 2018, I finally plunged into the making of the Goose Village and was given access to the expropriation archives. There were thousands of morose pictures to sort through without any description in the database or a supplementary document that ex could expedite the de decoding, the indexical system. So when I saw the show, I then contacted the museum. They gave me access to their archives. They were amazing. And then through their inf the information that they provided for me, I was able to contact the city of Montreal, and they automatically sent me 2,000 images for me to download. And it was uh, you know, a very telling moment because, like I said, there were so many images to, to sift through, no indexical system. I had no idea what I was looking at, what street, but I became fully absorbed by the minutiae in every image hoping to find clues about the properties and the people in them. The exercise was quite frustrating and seemingly futile because didactic descriptors that could be useful and lead to civic addresses did not exist. So I enlisted my father to help. Uh, his keen eye actually helped identify where people lived and properties once stood, offering critical observations and many answers. So I printed a lot of these images, very small, and then I put them in, then my studio was in my home in, uh, on the wall, and it was there that my father was able to say, this is where I live, this is where so-and-so lived, this is where this existed. Um, but of course, he's not a geographer or an architect that can put things together, uh, and, was, and we were dealing with images that were in black and white that um, were sometimes very difficult to read. And then, uh, what happened was that uh, a phenomena occurred when I judiciously examined uh, the home interiors, hoping to ascertain if any of these domestic spaces belonged to my parents or relatives. I did the same with photographs in my family album, trying to find a match. And the congruity of the puzzle pieces came together auspiciously with this image of uh, a living room with a doll displayed on the sofa. And I kept looking at this image and thinking there's something about it that's, that, that keeps me, that, that, that I go back to. Subsequently, when I gained access to the Furfaro Yurachi family album, Friends of the Family, I spotted a photograph of Clelia and Joe posing in their living room, which possessed similar characteristics to the one of that peculiar doll. The details in the core were undistinguishably identical, and I also realized that one of the rare color photographs in our family archive of my parents was taken in that same room. The three photographs corresponded. This epiphany transpired at the most opportune moment when I met Gilles Lauzon, who is a trained architect and historian who once worked for the city archive. Gilles had the answers I was searching for. First, he confirmed that the auxiliary document was lost or destroyed. Then, when I showed him the three images, the relationship between the three images that I just showed you, that I discovered of the house where my parents lived, his expertise and wisdom unraveled the underlying principle of the obscure alphabetical and numerical system found on the foreground of every image. Through further investigation, he took on with the help of his partner, Denis Tremblay, the fastidiously detailed and arduous task of decoding, identifying, and correctly matching all the photographs in the archive to the exact address and street names. 
This allowed me, with the help of Pedro, <laughs> to stitch together the most accurate street views and panorama of Goose Village. So basically, Pedro's very good digitally, as you can see, uh, but like we, we put the pictures all down in the studio, on the studio floor, and then we would do like batches of 10 at a time, and then Pedro would go on the computer and stitch them. And we were able to uh, stitch together the most accurate view and panoramas of Goose Village. But this was a, it's a very long thing to do. This image, I don't know how many days and hours it took, but what happened is that I was able to create For Far North, which is uh, an accurate view of what the street once looked like with all images from the archive that were also corrected uh, in terms of parallax, so it could look as accurate as possible. And then behind that, uh, the background is an image of what Four Far Street looks like today, which is, you know, a wasteland. It was, you know, Pedro's wizardry, Denis Tremblay, Gilles Lauzon, and my father, the astute memory of my father, who resided at three different addresses on Four Far Street that was beneficial and that helped, you know, build uh, Four Far North. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that, uh, which we'll get into the details in the conversation, but this is where architecture is found in my work, in anything I've done. Gilles Lauzon was the leather to my lace. It was, through his it was through my discovery that he could decode the archives in dexical nature, and it was through his meticulous puzzle that I was able to um, create uh, to recreate a built and living environment that had been destroyed uh, and, and rebuild it through photography. So when I began conducting field work in the fall of 2018, I was confronted by this barren industrial wasteland, as mentioned, the parking lot. And I imagined creating a, visual arresting a visually arresting body of work would be a Sisyphean task. However, uh, shooting on location over four years to chronicle the various permutations of this grim landscape was fundamental to the timeline and a mal necessaire. As I embarked on this psychogeographical journey, I regularly came across vegetation and flowering shrubs sprinkled along the periphery, offering some respite from the abject state of this banal parking lot. What used to be Four Far Street is now invaded by aster, bindweed, chamomile, Queen Anne's lace, and more. So this is for Far Street today. And I cannot help but hypothesize that the invasive weeds still populating the area must be vestiges of the past and poetically muse that villagers unwittingly found a way to leave their mark. I photographed these marginal habitats fervently and made large-scale prints that I used as backdrops for the in-studio portrait sittings and video-recorded oral history interviews with the project's participant. It was a way of connecting them to their past. I also worked on a still life component, and I created a visual timeline of eight panels transporting the viewer through a chronology of the neighborhood beginning in the 1800s leading to 1964, underscoring the, the, the neighborhood's metaphorical rise, decline, and eventual disappearance. Each panel consists of an edited selection of documents, maps, newspaper articles, and photographs from various archives pertinent to each era. This timeline was essential to, build, uh, to help build the narrative. In, in conclusion, I'd like to say that Goose Village signals how poor urban planning decisions affect working class communities' physical erasure. Memory mapping became very important exercises that were conducted with many of the villagers so that it was a way of remembering where streets once stood and uh, places uh, once existed. The guiding logic is to foreground and honor absent voices through first-person testimonies, shed light on a critical chapter of Montreal's urban patrimony, and my family's interpersonal connections to the neighborhood. The purpose is twofold, to highlight the destructive consequences of short-term political agenda and capitalist ills of hallmark events that cause displacement and to commemorate the villagers through a compassionate lens. While no second act exists for the Goose Village, what has vanished warrants recognition and should occupy a place of distinction 
in our collective history and urban memory. Which is, the last image I'm gonna show you is that there's actually, there's a book, and the book became all the more important uh, for it to be uh, made and created because a, a, an exhibition has a very short lifespan, span, but a book is there for a much longer time, and that was my way of leaving a mark for the villagers, for the narrative uh, to keep going. Thank you.